Mr. Speaker. I call the honourable member Jan Logie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Green Party. Uh, po as... Point of order, the oh. honourable member Rajan Prasad. Oh, well, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Speaker, you were busy, but on two occasions in the last minute, the minister has used the word "that's a lie," uh, and on two occasions, one when the member was speaking, and one just then. May I ask you to okay. ask it with Thank more you. Can I, I have to say I was actually busy calling the honourable member um, there, but if the member did use that word, then she should withdraw and apologise. Well, all I can say is that. All members are honourable members, their word is their bond, and if members are found to have not honoured that, then there are repercussions through the Privileges Committee. Uh, speaking to the Court of Order, the I certainly, uh, Paula Mr Bennett. Speaker, did not call him a liar. Um, what I did say was I felt that there were lies, but I did not call him a liar. Right. And so I did not besmirch the um, no. members by calling him a liar. <laughs> Well, can, can I thank the Minister for explaining the situation, but nevertheless, we have a rule in this place that no one is called a liar because indirectly, you're not actually calling the person that, you're actually insinuating that the whole Parliament's like that. So in that case, I just ask the Minister to withdraw and apologise. And withdraw and apologise. Thank you. Long. Thank you. Much appreciated. I call the Honourable Member Jan Logie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Green Party, as stated several times already, will oppose this bill. We will continue to offer alternative solutions and that we hope after the next election we can be part of building a society that has a strong foundation based on a Kiwi sense of a fair go and community. We have many specific concerns with the content of this bill, many concerns regarding the context within which it is operating, we have many concerns with what we see as some pretty fundamental inconsistencies within this bill, and many concerns regarding the underlying values inherent in this bill. Ultimately, we have a different vision for our society and a different view of our fellow New Zealanders. So I'd like to speak to that a little bit more. Last night, I went to a presentation by um, a great organisation called Kids Can that is working in New Zealand to provide raincoats for children that don't have them, shoes for those that don't have them, and food in lower decile schools. Now, this group isn't a political group. They're not advocating for structural change. But what they described is absolutely relevant to our sense of social security and welfare. They described children who don't know when their birthday is because their parents haven't got enough money to be able to put on birthday parties. They described children, little girls, who are getting their heads shaved because the family, the cost of buying lice treatment is half of their income. They described children who are going to bed in raincoats that have been given to them by this organisation because that's the warmest thing they own. And this organisation was very clear that they have not met one parent who does not want the best for their children. They have not met one parent who doesn't try their hardest for their children. That is the context that we are living in. This is not about poor parenting. This is about inadequate income. Two out of five families living in poverty are working families. Pushing people out off welfare into work will not solve the problem of poverty in this country. What we need to do is increase our base income. This bill does nothing to achieve social security. So now to speak to a little bit more around the content of this bill and the points that we oppose. We oppose the contracting out of services. And while the minister talks about the wraparound service for young people and the need to care, I absolutely wholeheartedly support that. I've worked with a, in the community with a lot of young people in that situation, and I really recognise when they haven't had family to stand by them, support is important. However, 
We cannot support this model when we are undermining the value and the functioning of community as opposed to state. And that is what this bill does. It puts community organisations into the role of the de facto state. That compromises the ability to build relationships and undermines their ability to respond to their community needs. We don't support the de starting point of controlling every young person's finances and putting them on payment cards. We had very um, strong evidence from some young people to the select committee and young people I spoke to as well about the need for flexibility. And in actual fact, many of their um, living situations tend to be quite tenuous and they need to be able to respond quickly and get out of bad situations. This is not going to help with that problem and in fact having automatic payments, things out of their control, may well put them into more precarious situations. We support aspiration for our young people. We don't support a one-size-fits-all solution, which NCEA Level 2 and that as a aspiration for all young people is. It's a one-size-fits-all. It doesn't recognise the needs of young people with learning disabilities. It doesn't recognise the needs of young people who are refugees who haven't even had literacy in their own first language. It doesn't follow best teaching practice, which is you focus on the students and their learning pattern, not the teachers or some external goal. We don't support the information sharing provisions in this bill, which weren't consistent with the Privacy Act, are an experiment, and we actually believe that the right of privacy goes over and should go beyond the um, government's experiments. We also have concerns that were brought up with us from young women around um, education, and we really support that model in terms of schools and young women being able to go into those schools and have their kids in the same place while they're learning. But we don't have many of those in our country. Um, so the chances are that a lot of these young women are going to be sent to courses that aren't going to have childcare on site. So they're going to be separated from their children and there's a real potential that's going to have an impact on their bonding. We don't believe that's good for the country. In terms of the... Uh, Provisions in relation to, if that member doesn't think these young women want to bond with their children, he has obviously not met many or had many discussions with them. The DPB, are they on that situation? The DPB, we don't support the work testing for five at all, actually. We believe that the evidence supports that when women are ready and their children are ready for them to go back to work, they start looking for work. We don't believe they need to be pushed, and we believe that their individual situations and reasons for being on the DPB in the first place actually often mean they should be there with their children, taking, putting their children first, and in many cases healing from what has been some very traumatic experiences, rather than trying to juggle the needs of their children, juggle the needs of a job, travel, and life. We believe that is unrealistic. But I'd like to speak just to um, some of the inconsistencies in this bill. One, where the intent, we're told, of this bill is to take an investment approach, a really radical approach, and that the, the minister said she makes no apology for the cost of this, that it's going to be expensive, but it's worth it because it will pay off. Yet, the government used its financial veto to rule out my um, SOP, which would have extended the training incentive allowance to higher grade courses, which we know are the courses that will enable women to get off the DPB six months earlier and enable them to stay off the DPB for longer. We've got clear evidence on that, and the cost of that bill was only five to $15 million. Thank you. And I'd also like to draw attention to the inconsistency where the government has said they purport to want the best for children. And yet again, they use their financial veto against Holly Walker's SOP, which would have provided the option for discretion when officials might have gauged that sanctioning a parent would have 
made it difficult to feed, clothe or care for the well-being of a child. And the government said that, well, that's going to cost millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, because they've budgeted for those sanctions. And the needs of the child obviously do not figure <laughs> in their considerations. For us, that's a fundamental inconsistency. I'd also just then just like to talk to um, some of the values. The government talks about the importance of work, and we also heard this from the ACT Party. We share that. Absolutely, work is important. Parenting is work. Actually contributing to our community is work, and most people want to work in paid work or otherwise. This is part of the way we shape our society, is by valuing work, not valuing things that we say are work, but not valuing what other people consider work. We'd also like to um, say that our understanding of a fair go is that everyone has, that we give our children a place to start in life that is comparable so that you can get ahead and everyone has the chance of getting ahead in life. And we know that when children are living in poverty, that means they're going to have poorer life outcomes poorer educational outcomes, poorer employment opportunities, a whole range of really negative things. This bill is in fact entrenching that inequality in our country. And I do not believe that inequality is a New Zealand value. I call the Honourable Member, Melissa.